Hello, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson House Lunch and Learn, Zoom at noon on Tuesdays. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Karcher. I'm the Executive Director of the Woodrow Wilson House. We are a site with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The physical house is based uh, on S Street. It's located on S Street, 2340 S Street in Washington, D.C., we broadcast these lunch and learn sessions uh, across the globe. In fact, we've had some people from California, from uh, London. I understand we had some people from Australia zoom in as well. So it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. This is a wonderful way for people across the world to hear what we talk about at the Woodrow Wilson House. We started this session on suffrage and learning about the suffrage movement in June. It has expanded and we've started to talk about all types of subjects. Today we're back to, to suffrage and talking about cooking and the cooking movement at su and suffrage. Um, and so, uh, but before we introduce Laura and her book, I'd like to bring you up to speed and what's happening at the Wilson House. A lot of exciting activity this last week. Um, the first is, uh, for those of you who've been following us on social media, we have uh, more people who have responded to our caption contest for the mystery lady who we have identified. You'll have to tune in and look in on our social media to see who she is. And now the question is, we want a caption. Come up with your most witty and uh, funny caption for the image that you see, and there'll be a winner. And that winner will have a guided tour of the Wilson House once we're open again for, for tours inside the house. Um, You'll also see that we are doing, and I think now with today's weather, you can see it's a perfect time to get outside and do walking tours. We have two walking tours available. One is an audio walking tour of the Calorama neighborhood and the Embassy Row neighborhood. And another is called the Wadi Wood uh, walking tour. The tour is actually called If These Walls Could Talk. And it's about people who lived in these famous uh, buildings, these architecture uh, buildings that were designed by Wadi Butler Wood. Um, so those two are available right now. They're pay what you will, pay what you wish, uh, download it online on our website and get out and get some exercise and take a walk in the neighborhood. Another thing that you can do at the Wilson House is after you've taken the walk, take some time to come see our suffrage outside exhibit in the backyard of the Woodrow Wilson House. The Woodrow Wilson House was actually designed by Wadi Butler Wood, and it's a house that's on the walking tour. And you can very easily take that walking tour. It's self-guided. You download it, take it when you like, and then make a, a book a time to come to the garden and see our exhibition called Suffrage Outside. It's all outside, all safe in the backyard. Uh, bring your family. It's um, it's really quite lovely and, and very whimsical. And uh, there'll be more about that uh, later on in this in the season. It will be open until November through November 1st. So get your tickets. Um, it, it's really quite something to see. Um, we also have uh, the speaker series, which we, as I said, we started in June. And now here we are in September. We have a full lineup for September and October into November. Our topics are, have, uh, have become a, a little bit more than just suffrage. We are talking about race, racism, segregation, um, women's movements. Um, we are bringing up subjects on, uh, that we wanna know more about. And that's just a plain and simple. Come for lunch, spend some time and learn something that you wanna know more about. And today actually happens to be about uh, the suffrage cookbooks. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about uh, today's topic. All stirred up suffrage cookbooks. Uh, Food and the Battle for Women's Right to Vote is written by Laura Kuhlman. It's in honor of the centennial, the, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, and it's a delectable new cookbook that reveals a new side to the history of the suffrage movement. Um, we all likely conjure up similar images of the suffrage movement, picket lines and red carnations and militant marches through the streets. But it was only these rallies that gained women the exposure and power to lead them to the vote? No, ever courageous and creative, creative suffragists also carried their radical message into America's homes 
wrapped in food wisdom through cookbooks, which ingeniously packaged political strategy into already existent social communities. These cookbooks gave suffragists a chance to reach out to women on their own terms in non-threatening and accessible ways. Cooking together, feeding people, and using social situations to put people at ease were pioneering grassroots tactics that leveraged the domestic knowledge these women already had, feeding spoonfuls of suffrage to communities through unexpected and unassuming channels. Laura Kuman is the author of the Hamilton Cookbook, and, and she expands upon this forgotten history, and she shows us that in spite of massive opposition, these women brilliantly wove charm and wit into their message. Filled with actual historic recipes, uh, one is mix the crust with tacked and velvet gloves using no sarcasm, especially with the upper crust. Uh, that evoke the spirited flavor of feminism and food movements, all stirred up, reactivates the taste of an era and carries us back through time. Kuhn shows us that these suffragists were far from militant, stern caricatures of their detractors made them out to be. Long before they had the vote, women enfranchised themselves through the subversive and savory power of the palate. Laura Kuhlman is the author of the Hamilton Cookbook, Cooking, Eating, and Entertaining in Hamilton's World, and runs the popular blog, Mother Would Know. Kuhlman earned a law degree from Columbia Law School and practiced in Washington, D.C. for more than two decades. She lives in Washington, D.C., where she now teaches cooking and food history. So with that, I'd like to welcome Laura. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you to Sarah Andrews, who's behind the scenes, and to all of you for coming. Um, we're going to spend about a little bit under an hour together, and we're going to begin by sort of talking about suffrage from my point of view, which is a little different from what you might hear from others, uh, other historians and writers about the movement. Um, then we're going to move on to talk about specifically the suffrage cookbooks, and hopefully I'll give you a little bit of insight into those very special uh, cookbooks. So first let's uh, figure out, oh, and of course there'll be questions at the end. Um, let's start with a little bit, we have two videos which are basically about suffrage. And the first is an overview. So Sarah. Hi, I'm Laura Kuman, author of All Stirred Up, Suffrage Cookbooks, Food, and the Battle for Women's Right to Vote. There's an old joke that says that every Jewish holiday has the same theme. They tried to kill us, we survived, now let's eat. My take on women's suffrage is similar. They would let us vote, we outsmarted them, now let's eat. Suffragists figured out that food wasn't just the key to a man's heart, it was the key to winning the right to vote. This is the story of the forgotten suffragists. Not the women who picketed, but the ones who went door to door, peddling suffrage with a cookbook under their arms. They sold that idea to people who might have otherwise hesitated to open the door, but couldn't resist a nice bowl of steaming hot soup or a tasty cookie. I'll bet you didn't even know there were suffrage cookbooks. I didn't either until I uncovered the amazing story of the women who fought for a voice in our democracy with recipes and rolled jelly cake. The idea for the suffrage battle was hatched way back in 1848, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and a few other women gathered for tea near Seneca Falls, New York. In their world, it was legal for a man to beat his wife, a woman could be arrested for trying to vote, and thousands of children died from contaminated milk. It would be more than 70 years with a civil war and World War in between from that first meeting until the ratification of the 19th Amendment at the start of the Roaring Twenties. Millions of American women and men battled for women's right to vote. In All Stirred Up, you'll find out how they fought and won using food as a tactic to persuade the nation. Then let's celebrate the 100th anniversary of the victory with food made from suffrage cookbook recipes Enjoy reading the original recipes and cooking from the adapted versions that I've created for your modern taste and convenience. And don't forget, the best way to celebrate the suffrage victory is to vote. So 
So as you could tell, women in the 1840s really had very few rights and really didn't have a lot of uh, the, what, what we would describe as a, a seat at the table. So why focus on suffrage when there was so much else? Well, the answer really comes down to the um, views of one man, which is uh, kind of a, a strange way to begin a suffrage story. But in my view, suffrage really takes a lot of unexpected turns. And that man was Frederick Douglass. He was the only person of color, as far as we know, at the Seneca Falls Convention. And when the, it looked as though all of the other resolutions would pass unanimously, but not the one about women's right to vote, he really stood up for that resolution and really put it through helping to make women's right to vote the, uh, what we remember of Seneca Falls. So the battle waged for over 70 years. And of course, 1848, you start to get into the uh, Civil War period. And the first 20 years of the battle were really a very unorganized movement. Um, there were conventions that were held, but there was really no organization that was in charge of this very important issue. After women started an organization, what happened? Well, that was after the Civil War, and there were internal struggles. The primary one at that point was whether the women's rights, the women, the, the women's right to vote organization should try to take the view that suffrage mattered even if it wasn't part of the 15th Amendment, which was the giving black men the right to vote, but not black women or white women. And of course, there were some women who said, well, we're not even in favor of the 15th Amendment because it doesn't give women the right to vote. Then as the 15th Amendment became law, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, a major issue developed within the suffrage organizations and the suffrage movement as to whether they should go for state by state suffrage or whether the movement should look at a federal amendment like the 15th. Well, we now know the end of that story, of course, because we have the 19th Amendment. But what happened in between? Well, there were many, many campaigns. And I just want to give you a list that was created in the 1920s by the woman who, who headed the mainstream organization, Carrie Chapman Catt, at the time of the 19th Amendment. Um, she and her co-author, um, Nettie Schuler, tallied up how many campaigns there really were. There were 56 referenda campaigns, 480 campaigns to urge legislatures to submit suffrage to a uh, vote in their states, 47 campaigns to induce state constitutional conventions to add women to the state constitutions, 277 campaigns to persuade state party conventions to include women's suffrage in their platform, 30 campaigns to urge national presidential parties to include suffrage in their platform, 19 campaigns in 19 successive Congresses to pass a federal constitutional amendment. Huh, that was really, I mean, think about it. Think about how many times women face defeat. So who were the supporters of suffrage? Well, there were, of course, the members of the organizations, but they really only were, at the very most, two million women. And on the uh, militant side, only tens of thousands, perhaps. But there were hundreds of thousands, even millions of other women who helped suffrage. And these are the women I'm talking about, really the forgotten suffragists. I like to call them the soldiers for suffrage. Now, there were also famous suffragists not the women that you might think of, the Susan B. Anthony's and the Lucretia Mott's, but there were people who were famous in their time who stood up for suffrage. Who were these people? Well, one of them was Clara Barton. And, you know, you might know her as the uh, angel of the battlefield, but she was a strong suffragist. 
Well, she, of course, wasn't the only one, but there were uh, allies. There were men. Now, in these days, we call them allies. In those days, a suffragist named Vitus Sutton coined the term suffragettes. And those suffragettes even had their own organization in New York called the Men's League for Women's Suffrage. And they used their power and, in fact, their connections to urge um, other powerful men to support suffrage. The suffragists were also very diverse. You know, when, we, when you look at those pictures of suffrage uh, marches, you will probably only see white women. And that's because, in fact, the suffrage movement, like a lot of what was going on at the time, was really racist. But there were many, many black suffragists. There were also suffragists of other, from other ethnic groups. There were, um, there were Asian suffragists, there were Native American suffragists, and there were many other people who were really shut out of the suffrage movement leadership and even shut out, unfortunately, some of the mass, mass campaigns. Now, who opposed suffrage? Well, a lot of people, unfortunately, and those people were called antis. I'd like to show you a little bit of a, a short video about the people who opposed suffrage. Those who opposed suffrage were called antis. If a woman can vote for legislative candidates, she can go to the legislature herself. If she can be a state lawmaker, she can go to Congress and be a national lawmaker. If she can get to Congress, she can be president of the United States if the people are foolish enough to elect her. There seems to be no hope of a stopping point when once we get started on the dangerous doctrine of political equality. The Antis certainly included prominent men who may have felt threatened at the prospect of women voting and entering the political arena. But the Antis also included women, many of whom were quite accomplished. One such auntie was Josephine Jewell Dodge, often known as Mrs. Arthur Dodge. She first became known, not for her anti-suffrage activities, but for her groundbreaking work around childcare. She founded a nursery for the children of working mothers on the Lower East Side of New York, founded both the Association of Day Nurseries of New York City and the National Federation of Day Nurseries. Mrs. Dodge thought men and women were fundamentally different and had different roles to play in society and the family. Voting, she believed, was part of a man's role and women had no place anywhere near the ballot box. She was one of the founders of the National Association opposed to women's suffrage and served as its president. In her words, Women's suffrage, in its last analysis, is a retrogressive movement towards conditions where the work of a man and a woman was the same, because neither sex had evolved enough to see the wisdom of being a specialist in its own line. A California auntie, Dora Oliphant Coe, looked at states where women had already won the vote, and she was appalled. In the states where women do vote, the women have, in the aggregate, become coarsened, have sold their votes, and corrupted the body politic. Politics affects the character of women more than women change the character of politics. When aunties spoke, they used rhetoric and passion, just like the suffragists they opposed. Mrs. James W. Wadsworth wasn't a preacher, but she could have been. May God fill our hearts with righteous indignation and touch our tongues with a divine fire of eloquence so that we may carry the gospel of anti-suffrage, anti-socialism, anti-feminism, anti-demoralization into every corner of the land with such an inspiring trumpet call that a mighty army of believers will rise and follow our flag to victory. In All Stirred Up, you'll not only find out about the women who won the right to vote, but about those who fought them at every turn. Well, I must say that learning about women like Josephine Jewell Dodge really made me question my stereotypes about the kinds of women who would oppose suffrage or oppose women's rights. Uh, Josephine Jewell Dodge, uh, others were Catherine Beecher, and maybe you know, uh, you've heard of Annie Meyer Nathan, Annie Nathan Meyer. Well, they weren't uh, opponents of women's education or childcare. 
They, in fact, were very prominent in those fields, but they did oppose women's right to vote. Well, who else opposed women's right to vote? Uh, certainly the liquor lobby, and that's because uh, the suffrage movement was very much connected to the temperance movement of the time. And as some of you may know, prohibition was a, a big issue in the years that suffrage was coming up for a vote. And uh, many of the suffragists were active in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, well, the liquor lobby and also political machines, because political machines, especially in the cities, they wanted um, to know who was going to vote for them and how to control them. And they felt that they couldn't control women. So they were really opposed to women getting the right to vote. Well, who, who did win the right to vote? Who were the women? Well, and how did they work? Well, they worked through grit and really through attacking, but in a very feminine and sometimes way, they would show that the stereotypes of the aunties weren't true. They were great marketers. Um, if any of you have ever seen these suffrage cupies, you may have seen cupies and not realized that they were in fact part of the suffrage. Uh, they, they were in fact part of the suffrage marketing. Um, isn't that an adorable little baby? Well, the, those kinds of cartoons were put on postcards, they were put on posters, they were sent in all, way, all different ways. Of course, they didn't have social media, but they had lots of other ways of spreading this kind of marketing. The suffragists also went everywhere. I mean, there were suffragists not only in the big cities and the small towns, but uh, we have a picture of a man on a, in a wagon and the suffragists are right by his side. You know, they went everywhere. They went to state fairs. He offers them a ride in this picture. And they went, they went by foot, they went by car, they went by horse and buggy, they went any way they could. Well, the last moments of the suffrage battle, when was that? That was in Tennessee, and it was really a cliffhanger. And it came down to one man, who was a legislator, a young legislator named Harry Byrne. How did Harry Byrne vote? Well, going into the battle, it looked as though he, he was, it was a vote on ratification of the suffrage amendment. They needed one more state. Tennessee was the state and it looked like suffrage was gonna go down to defeat. Harry Byrne looked like he was gonna vote against it and he was gonna be the deciding vote. But crumpled up in his pocket, Harry Byrne had a letter from his mother, and his mother said, be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. And guess what? Harry Byrne did. He voted for suffrage. Well, that meant that suffra the suffrage amendment was ratified. You think that's the end? The 19th Amendment is ratified? Nope. The opponents of suffrage filed a lawsuit and they filed it in Maryland. It wasn't until 1922 that a unanimous Supreme Court ruled in a case that's called Lesser versus Garnett that the 19th Amendment was validly ratified. So that's two more years. Everybody celebrates the 100th anniversary in 1920, 2020, but I don't know, for me, it's 2022 that's really the end of the battle. Okay, but unfortunately, the suffrage amendment wasn't the end for many women. And we all know that it took until the 1960s for African-American women to really get the voting rights through the Voting Rights Act that uh, enabled them to vote. And even today, there's, of course, voter suppression. Um, so when we celebrate the right to vote, we have to remember that the battle is never really won. What does suffrage mean for us today? Well, it means two things, at least to me. First of all, it settled the issue of whether women had a right to vote, but it also settled a lot of other issues, whether we could serve on juries, serve in the military. So suffrage was really not just about voting, it was about a whole bunch of rights. And then the second thing it did, it was what Thomas Cahill calls a hinge on history. And that meant that it opened the door. Well, it opened the door for a lot of things. A lot of women to do, to serve in state legislatures, to serve in 
the federal Congress to serve as governors, as mayors. Um, very ironically, the first woman who was elected after suffrage was actually an anti. Can you imagine a woman who voted, who, who spoke out against women's right to vote? She stood for election and she, in fact, won. It was in Oklahoma and her name is uh, in the book. So let's turn now to the suffrage cookbooks. And I have a quick little video to give you an overview of what they're about. The battle for women's right to vote took over 70 years. The army of supporters needed money to fund their cause and a way to begin conversations, to get folks to open their doors and their minds to the radical proposition that women should be able to vote in every election that men could vote in. That's where suffrage cookbooks came in. You won't learn about suffrage cookbooks from most other accounts of the fight for women's suffrage. I had never heard of them myself until I happened upon one of these amazing cookbooks and dug into the story of the trailblazing women who helped convince a nation with hot cross buns and Boston fish chowder. We'll never know how many suffrage cookbooks there were. We only know of those that have survived, fewer than 10 today. But there are tantalizing hints of several others now lost to us. The surviving suffrage cookbooks begin with a slim volume created in Boston in the 1880s. This cookbook includes three recipes for Washington pie, a protest against pepper, and directions for nine different types of disinfectants. Suffragists in Rockford, Illinois, put together the holiday gift cookbook a few years later. The largest suffrage cookbook is from Washington State, where suffragists put together one with hundreds of recipes. At the opposite end in terms of size, an organization of women household workers collaborated with the Women's City Club of Long Beach, California to publish a sweet pamphlet called Little Tastes of Enfranchisement that runs less than 20 pages. The latest suffrage cookbook we know of comes from the women of Wayne County, Michigan, and it includes a recipe for a 15 pound wedding cake. In All Stirred Up, I'll tell you more about these fascinating cookbooks and how suffragists use food to win over the nation. So what did suffrage cookbooks really do? Well, they served two purposes. They were first and foremost fundraisers. Uh, they were sold. They were sold by women who took them around. They were sold through the suffrage magazines and newspapers. And they were sold at state fairs, even at uh, national um, the Pan American Fair, which was a huge fair in Washington State, um, a huge international fair. Um, but there was a second wit, a second um, reason that suffrage cookbooks were created. They really opened people up to a conversation about suffrage, people who might not otherwise have been interested in talking politics. And as a marketing tool, they brought in really three groups of people. One was the people who gave them the recipes. I mean, these are cookbooks that have recipes from women and some men far and wide. Even the one in Boston in the 1880s had a recipe from people far away in Idaho, in the far west. And these cookbooks really caused people to be interested in contributing to the suffrage cause, not just money. In fact, their family recipes. It also brought in those who who went out and peddled them. Many women peddled them door to door and they used them as a technique for canvassing. So if a woman wanted to get uh, somebody interested in a conversation, she might bring a cookbook along with her, offering the cookbook sometimes for a few cents or a dollar, and then slowly moving the conversation to suffrage. Now the third group were those people who bought the books or who ate the food and of course, we know that really it's very odd, but if you think about it, who really created suffrage for women? It was the men who voted. And in fact, it was the men who were really, um, who these cookbooks were intended to reach because the food that women created through these cookbooks, and it really was women who were the primary cooks in those days, um, that food went to many men. So several of the cookbooks have what we call celebrity endorsements. Um, 
you remember how I mentioned that Clara Barton was a, a suffragist and a very uh, staunch supporter of suffrage? Well, she contributed to the first suffrage cookbook, to the one in Boston. And I want to read you her quote because it really gives me goosebumps. And she said, when you were weak and I was strong, I toiled for you. Now you are strong and I am weak. Because of my work for you, I ask your aid. I ask the ballot for myself and my sex. As I stood by you, I pray you stand by me and mine. That was Clara Barton just after the Civil War, after she had been a nurse to many of the Union soldiers. Now these cookbooks are in fact community cookbooks. What does that mean? Well, they were created during they were created after the Civil War, which is the period when community cookbooks were quite popular. And they reflected the food of their time. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm old enough to remember Home Ec. And Home Ec was uh, what domestic science was rebranded as. But when it began, domestic science was really the way for women to be allowed into the scientific world. Well, they could really only stay at home, so they did the science of being at home, the science of being in the kitchen, the science of cleaning, and that was really how domestic science began. If you look at the types of recipes in these books, today we, were say, we would say they were oversauced, overcooked, and underflavored. If you look at the domestic science or home ec movement, you look at what, what they were espousing, they were really espousing, covering things in sauce, cooking them a long time, and they weren't great fans of herbs and spices. Also, another thing you'll notice about the recipes in the suffrage cookbooks, to the extent that they reflect any ethnic groups, they really are Americanized versions of foods from different cultures. Now, as the video pointed out, the cookbooks are very different one from another. Um, and there is one of these cookbooks, uh, which is now, in fact, available um, in a reprint. It's the uh, one from, from Pittsburgh, but it was put together by a woman whose name was Kleber, L.O. Kleber. And she included some recipes that were really not recipes for cooking, but rather recipes, food for thought, shall we say. And the one that Elizabeth mentioned in the beginning I want to read it to you. It's called Pie for a Suffragist Doubting Husband. It's got only two ingredients. The first is one quart of the milk of human kindness, and the second is eight reasons. And the eight reasons are war, white slavery, child labor, eight million working women, bad roads, poisonous water, and the eighth was impure food. The directions are very simple. Mix the crust with tapped and velvet gloves using no sarcasm, especially with the upper crust. Upper crust must be handled with extreme care for they quickly sour if manipulated roughly. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a bit about suffrage and from a perhaps slightly different point of view. Um, my takeaway from learning about the forgotten suffragists is really that it takes all kinds of people. Yes, it takes those who are willing to be on the front lines and to be arrested and to picket, but it also takes those who are willing to do really hard work but unseen work. And um, these are not the Alice Paul and her hunger strikers or Inez Milholland, the woman you saw on the white horse who was in fact a uh, well-known and, and really a celebrity in her time. Um, but it was really people who wanted to build bridges, who wanted to, um, shall we say, convince rather than um, cause chaos or cause consternation. Um, if we only learn and we only honor the, the big names and the loud women, well, we're really missing out on what suffrage was all about, which is rights for all women. So thanks, and I hope you have some good questions for me. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really terrific. I love the videos, and I think that's also some, uh, some of the feedback that we had from the chat. 
Um, I have a few questions that I have. That first is uh, the the cast iron skillet on the cover. Do you always cook with cast iron? Is that something that started at the turn of the century? Is that how did you come about having a cast iron skillet on your cover? Well, I had an amazing graphic designer. Is the answer because I do cook with cast iron, not always, but in fact, the cast iron represents what um, happened in the suffrage movement, which is that the suffrage movement really got its powerful, um, shall we say, not its start necessarily, but the really the power that got it to 1920 through the Western states. And, um, you know, I think it's kind of a Western theme. Nice. That's great. I like to cook with cast iron. So uh, I, that was one of the first things that caught my attention. Uh, someone asked, have you tried all the recipes in the book? Every one of the recipes in the book is, both, is printed in both the original and an adaptation that I've created. Not only have I tested them, but they've been tested by my very discerning um, staffs. And you will find many notes in the adaptations that suggest perhaps you want to put more herbs in or show you how I have tried to keep to the the recipe, keep the, the, really the nub of the recipe, but make it more to our taste. Mm -hmm. And of all the recipes you tried, which is your favorite and which is his favorite? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's like asking which is your favorite child. Um, <laughs> although I would say that I love the gingerbread, which is an unusual one. It's made with sour cream. Interesting. Uh, did you do research at the Radcliffe Cookbook uh, Archive? I did not. And unfortunately, um, I got in touch with the people at Radcliffe just before uh, COVID. And so, uh, well, you know, they in the beginning of COVID, if everybody remembers, things really shut down. And so I wasn't able to keep that up. Um, I did, however, have some really, really incredible librarians at the Library of Congress um, one of whom I think might still be on this call, Arlene Balkansky. Um, and I just cannot speak highly enough of librarians, both at the Library of Congress and elsewhere. Um, I have one story that I think is really kind of wonderful, which is that um, there are seven or eight existing suffrage cookbooks, depending on how you count them. And there was one of those eight, which is the Rockford cookbook you saw, that I had not been able to get or to see. And when I tried to figure out where it was, as far as I could tell, there's only one copy that's left in existence. And I thought it was with a woman who was a librarian at the University of Michigan. Well, I spoke to the curator of culinary arts at the University of Michigan, and she told me that that librarian who is famous in the culinary world had retired. But this librarian offered to get in touch with her. She got in touch with her. The librarian said that the, the uh, book, the pamphlet is really too, uh, at, this, at this point, it's just too delicate to even scan it. Hmm. And she, but she told me that she had given it to an academic years ago. And I knew about that because I had read the academic paper this, this professor had written. So I wrote to the professor and the professor still had the scan from a decade ago, and she was kind enough to send it to me. Fascinating. That's an amazing story. That's really amazing. Um, we, uh, one of the things that struck me is that they would sell the, this cookbook, and one of the things that I, at, for, to raise money for the suffrage movement, um, and when, I was, when we were doing some research on cooking at the Wilson House, we came to realize that there had been a, cook, a, a Woodrow Wilson House cookbook that was compiled, uh, once again, as a fundraiser, I'm sure, for the Wilson House years ago. And we were starting to pour over the recipes that were uh, brought up from, um, for instance, the White House dining room and state dinner recipes. So uh, there is a, this tradition in America of people compiling recipes and then selling them 
as somehow as a fundraiser. So, and it's very exciting to see that this was historic in the sense that they, the suffrage movement did it as well. Um, yes, well, in fact, those are called community cookbooks. And there is a librarian at the Library of Congress who's really written the definitive work on community cookbooks. It's really very exciting that um, librarians do this research for us and they really help us to understand, you know, many of us have had community cookbooks in our houses. We know our temples and our churches do them. Uh, we know schools do them. It really started right after the Civil War. But it's amazing to go back and see those cookbooks as a sense of history, as historians, to see what people were eating. Social scientists, social historians to say, what were people eating? How did they get this type of food in this, in this neck of the woods? Um, we were talking about uh, Wilson himself and growing up in Stanton and having oysters. And you think, what were they doing getting, what were they doing eating oysters? Um, and that that's actually not, was not a highbrow food at all. In fact, a hundred years ago, the oysters came in once, once a week and that's what everybody in town ate. Um, and so when you read these collective histories, you get a sense of what life was like a hundred years ago, just by the fact of what was delivered to the town, what kind of fresh food and produce was delivered to a town. Um, Someone's asked about the book and how to get it. There are a few ways you can go online. Uh, we are selling Laura's book at the bookshop at the Woodrow Wilson House. So if you come to take a walk in the neighborhood, stop in. Our bookshop is open. If you come in to do our suffrage outside exhibit, uh, we will. this book is on the counter ready to be sold. Um, another point that you brought up is that there were not, uh, that, that, that the black women were put, somewhat outside the mainstream white women's movement of the um, of the suffrage movement and that race actually played a hand a big hand in how this um, in how the suffrage movement unfolded a hundred years ago do you have any cookbooks or any histories of uh, African American black women in, uh, immigrant women or um, uh, Asian American families and their cookbooks well, I did look, and unfortunately, I couldn't find anything. Um, I did ask a number of Black academics and um, a woman named Tony Tipton Martin, if any of you know her. She's recently written Jubilee. Um, she also wrote Jema The Jemima Code. Um, but no one really knows at this point uh, whether the Black suffragists had their own versions of suffrage cookbooks. Uh, we also can't tell what they contributed, if anything, to the suffrage cookbooks that exist, because, of course, to the extent that there are names, you can't tell what someone's race is. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that probably a number of the recipes that were contributed are not necessarily the recipe of the woman whose name is on the recipe. Mm -hmm. It would be the name of her cook, which in those in that period... There were many women, white middle-class women who didn't themselves cook. They had their cooks. Mm -hmm. They had immigrant cooks and they had black cooks. And it is quite probable that some of the recipes are from those people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> I had another question and that is, um, do you think, did you see in doing the research that the recipes changed region to region? Well, they do somewhat. I mean, you can see the recipes for Boston fish chowder, for example, in the Boston cookbook. Um, but one of the interesting things to me was how recipes moved. So, for example, brownies were created in about 1900, the very late uh, 1890s, early 1900s, on the East Coast. In this was the era of uh, Fanny of the Boston Cooking School. Mm -hmm. uh, but by 1909, they're in the Washington State cookbook. And in fact, I use their, I put their brownie recipe in my book because it's the great old fashioned brownie recipe that many of us grew up with. Um, and that obviously traveled, you know, without social media um, in not too long, you know. As a historian, when did jello molds become popular? <laughs> well, Jello molds are definitely a 20th century thing. Um, but I have in the book something which is interesting to me, which is that, you know, we all think of gelatin 
and we think of jello as if it's flavored mm -hmm. but in fact you can use gelatin and there's a recipe for a pineapple sherbet which is made with fresh pineapple it has only three ingredients fresh pineapple sugar and unflavored gelatin mm. interesting any other top recipes you're saying it's like your your choose your favorite child you we talked about the ginger snaps, the ch chocolate brownies. Anything else that we should say, yes, we're going to try that one? Well, the gingerbread, uh, the brownies, I would say, I actually like some of the, the meat recipes. I mean, there's something which is called hodgepodge. Well, it's beef stew. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I have taken their chicken recipe and given it the more modern name, which is really spatchcock chicken. If any of you know Kenji Lopez Alt, who is a fabulous foodie and wrote the Food Lab, well, he's the king these days of spatchcock chicken. And yet here it is in the suffrage cookbook, you know, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, we, someone, and please, anyone online, if you've got questions, send them into the chat and we'll, we'll definitely ask them. Uh, Cynthia wrote, I have a recipe for a chocolate sorbet that uses gelatin, which seems to make it smooth rather than icy. Are there any other tips for using gelatin? Well, I discovered that it, it can turn into granules. Um, my tip was just that you have to really get it, you have to really dissolve it well, because once it's granules, you really have a hard time working with it. So it comes in a powder form, and you really want to make sure it's dissolved. How did you come up with the Hamilton cookbook? Um, actually, that somebody asked me to write it. The publisher asked me to write it. Uh, there was an editor there who knew me and thought that I was probably, I guess, the right person. So, and how did it come to be the Suffrage Cookbook? Suffrage Cookbook, I really discovered one of the Suffrage Cookbooks. And it led me on, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a treasure hunter. Only my kind of treasure is information, uh, not gold. <laughs> Um, and so uh, once I found one, I was really fascinated. I wanted to know how many were there. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I'm, I've been known to stay up till midnight looking when I find like a trace of one. And I keep thinking, oh, it's buried in somebody's attic or it's in some state historical society. And somebody just doesn't realize that it belongs in this incredible panoply of cookbooks um so yeah so, that's well, so that goes out to any of our listeners if you are going through your uh, family attics and basements and you come across an old uh, community cookbook or a family recipe family cookbook send it over to laura it seems like she'll yeah. be able to uh, she this is the kind of information that she's looking for um well i'm looking for somebody in nebraska anybody know anyone who was in nebraska about a hundred mm, 120 years ago. <laughs> well, we'll send that out on our, on our blog. Um, do you have any child-friendly recipes or recipes those of us who are not that accomplished in the kitchen um, can use? Fewer, ingredient, fewer ingredients, not too complicated? Any yeah, well, as I said, the pineapple sherbet is easy. The brownies are easy. Um, a lot of the recipes, some of the recipes for meat are very simple. Um, there are a lot of salad recipes. Interesting. Interestingly, they have a couple of vegetable recipes. Uh, there's something called emergency salad, which was very popular at the time. We have pizza emergency today. <laughs> <laughs> they had salad emergency. I think it's fascinating that you, you don't see things that are um, highly seasoned. And the reason I, that I say that is, you know, Victory Gardens started at the time of World War I, which is also around the same time we're talking about the suffrage movement. Uh, we did some research on what people planted in their Victory Gardens. It wasn't just um, fruits and vegetables, but also herbs. People would have a kitchen garden or that had uh, a lot of herbs. So I'm surprised having grown these herbs, you, we didn't see more recipes using the herbs. Do you have any insight to that? Well, part of the domestic science movement was really about what they thought was healthy. And for whatever reason, they had some very bizarre ideas about what was healthy. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that they thought that a very bland diet was the best diet. Well, Woodrow Wilson said that when he had a tummy ache, he referred to it as 
the equatorial region was disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> the disturbance in the equatorial region. Um, yes, they and so they did take uh, their their constitution very seriously to make sure that they stayed healthy. Um, do you have what are your favorite cookbook authors? Oh, there are so many that I like. Um, I'm currently really a fan of uh, Adina Sussman, who writes a cookbook that is sort of Middle Eastern. Um, I've been cooking a number of her recipes. Uh, Michael Solomonov, who did Zahab. It's a restaurant in Philadelphia. So mm -hmm. I'm sort of into a Middle Eastern thing. Okay. I, there, I, there's not many Middle Eastern recipes in this cookbook. No, no, no. no. And, <laughs> and in fact, you know, if you look at the recipes in, in All Stirred Up that I picked out, from the suffrage cookbooks. I mean, I picked out something called Mexican noodles. There is nothing Mexican about these noodles. And honestly, they're not my favorite recipe. It's not my favorite recipe. But I felt like people had to see what it was that, that the suffragists thought was, uh, you know, a recipe from another culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And also I'm sure what would sell, what, what was how you could market this. And so they probably, uh, just the fact of having some different recipes to appeal to different audiences. Um, does anyone have any other questions? If you don't, I have one of my questions, which is, um, uh, how did you do the research? When you were doing the research, um, were you, and you said you're doing it online, did you do it all going, did you go anywhere or was it mostly virtual research? Well, I went to the Library of Congress. I spent many hours in the Library of Congress. Um, one of the things that's quite amazing is that the library has a lot that's digitized. Um, I did, in fact, get a number of books about suffrage also, so I was able to stay at home and, and read about suffrage. But the, through the library, you can also get to a lot of other digital um, resources. For example, there's something called the Hathi Trust, where many books are digitized and mm -hmm. it's really an incredible resource. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And did you, um, how long did it take you to do this? Well, I would say I, I probably spent about a year on it. Um, oh, there's one, there's also, there's a store in New York where I started my research, which is an incredible place called Kitchen Arts and Letters. If anybody knows of it, you can follow them on Instagram or you can go to their website. And that is really, it's not a, a cooking cookbook store. It's about food. So they do have cookbooks, but they have a lot of food history. They have some older books. And they really had a lot of books about domestic science and about what food was like during suffrage times, mm -hmm. which is a lot of what my book is about. So what's your next project? Well, I'm kind of, tossing around something, uh, not talking about it right now, but it does have to do with food and uh, culture and a little bit of history. Okay, okay, well, we'll stay tuned. You do have a blog site, don't you? Uh, yes, actually I have two. I have Mother Would Know, but I also have lauracuman.com, which is really about the books. I love the title Mother Would Know. <laughs> Named by a former babysitter, okay. who uh, I, I would often say when she texted me a food question, why don't you ask your mother? And she said, well, my mother would know, but I don't really want to talk to my mother. I just want the answer to this question. <laughs> I remember my, with my own mother, someone said to her, how did, you know, they asked her some question and they said to her, how did you know that? And my mother said, I'm old. I <laughs> <laughs> mother would know, she's old. <laughs> Which one of the things about the suffrage cookbooks the original recipes, it's so interesting when you read them, is that that's the way our grandparents cooked. Mm -hmm. If you look at, well, grandmothers, if you look at it, it calls for a pinch of this or a handful of that or cook it till it's done. What does that mean? Right. What's the temperature? What's, you know, what kind of dish should you use? How long should you cook it? What's a handful? And so they were home economics any longer. People are that we we don't even have that skill that we're be, that we're teaching in schools today. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
I want to thank you for contributing today and your presentation. It was really very insightful, um, educational. It brought a new dimension to what we're learning about, about the suffrage movement. I think you hit on a number of topics that we ourselves are doing either research on or talking about, with, uh, in, especially in the research that we did for our suffrage outside exhibit. We have a section on women who are outside the mainstream of the movement. We have a section on women outside the United States and how they were uh, an inspiration or um, really our mentors in, for, in the American uh, movement. Um, we had a section on uh, mobilizing for war outside the United States and how that changed uh, some of the, the suffrage movement for women. Um, yeah. And also I appreciate, because we got to talk a little bit about the Victory Garden that we have growing in the front of the Woodrow Wilson House. So um, this conversation, uh, hit on a number of themes that we've got going on at the Wilson House, so I appreciate that. Um, I have another, uh, people are thanking you. Uh, we've got any other questions about purchasing the book. Again, as I said, you can get it at the Wilson House. Uh, it's on sale. Um, we also had some links here available uh, on our chat for uh, Laura's blog, as well as links to where the book can be purchased online. Uh, and with that, I say thank you very much. If we don't have any other questions, we'll, we'll uh, say thank you and goodbye. We appreciate it. So for those of you wondering about next week, it's going to be Professor Corey Garibaldi. He'll be speaking about the fence at Princeton and what that says about race and Wilson's um, view on race. So I ask you to tune in again next week, uh, Tuesday at noon on Zoom. Uh, and we have another other lineup of speakers for the rest of the month, again in, in October. So um, please sign up. It's, as you see, it's very easy uh, and it's free and we welcome you to join us. Um, and we hope we'll see you at the Wilson House one day soon. Thank you and have a Great. wonderful afternoon. Okay. Thank you.